We read from God's word in Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. (coughs) And I'm reading from the New King King James Version. Uh, Acts 24. Let us hear the word of God. Now, after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullius. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always. And in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from me, from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, he even tried to put profane the temple, the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may, you may, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse you. And the Jews also ascended, maintaining that these things were so. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Insomuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any, anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offence toward God and men. Now after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me, found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who, who, who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. 
But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix wanted to do the Jews, wanting to do the Jews a favour, left Paul bound. Amen. My text is found in the reading in Acts chapter 24 and verses 14 to 16. Acts 24 verses 14 to 16. <coughs> But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, but there should be, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offence towards God and towards men. The background to this, this text is an amazing adventure, and I try to, to, to paraphrase it really, and it's this. Paul at this time was in Jerusalem and the Jewish authorities accused him of blasphemy uh, and they said he was blaspheming because he was bringing Gentiles into the temple and the Jews caused a commotion and Lysias the Roman tribune in charge of the Jerusalem garrison of 1,000 soldiers. Here's the commotion, and he sends soldiers out to bring Paul into the barracks at Fortress Antonia. And before he enters the barracks, he is allowed to address the crowd, that's Paul now, on the steps of the fortress. When Paul said he had been sent to the Gentiles, they wanted to kill him. But Lysias took Paul into the barracks, and he took him in there to question him, question him and to flog him. Paul tells him he's a Roman citizen, and so they stop. And then the Jewish it gets, it gets more amazing. The Jewish authorities plot to kill Paul. And they ask the Roman tribune, Lysias, to bring him to them in order that he can be further questioned. And there's ambush here. Forty of them vow to ambush them and kill Paul. Gets better. <laughs> the, the son of Paul's sister hears the plot and tells Lysias. Lysias takes Paul, think of this, one man. Lysias takes Paul, accompanied by four, 470 soldiers from Jerusalem to Caesarea. They take him there because it's there that Felix, the Roman governor, is based. Felix, Felix asked the chief priests and some of the elders to come and make the case against Paul. They come together with a lawyer named Tertullius who presents the case against Paul. I hope that's clear. It's, it's an amazing adventure, isn't it? It's a wonderful adventure. It's a, it's a marvellous adventure story. And our text is part of Paul's reply. And from the text, I want to bring out um, aspects of faith found in Paul. So I want to use the texts to bring out aspects of true faith found in Paul. So having told you the background, the first point is this. Paul's faith is a personal experience. Notice what he says. 
Verse 14, I confess. So worship I. Verse 16, do I, ex I exercise myself? So the first point I want to drive home to you is that a Christian has a personal faith in Christ. Paul did not always have this personal faith. Listen to what he says about himself before he became a Christian. Philippians 3, 4, 5, and 6. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as teaching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, presenting, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And then after he became a Christian, he says this in verse 7 of Philippians 3, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So, I want to emphasize this aspect of true faith, and that's this, that true faith is a personal experience. Now, have you true faith? Have you had a personal experience, encounter with God? Um, I, I don't want to draw attention to myself but let me let me just tell you let me give you my testimony brought up in a christian family going to a church as i told you this morning three times on a sunday um to the mid midweek meetings to the children's meetings and so on and then at 17 i was sitting under the ministry of the word of god in hebron in the church it was a right speaking church then and for months my stomach was churning up for months. And I would go out. I was sitting upstairs with a group of young people and I used to count the bald heads and the best hats in the congregation as young people do. They used to do that, you know. <laughs> I used to do that. But then I was... Um, the gospel was getting at me. The man was preaching the gospel. He's Arminian, but it was a gospel. And my stomach was churning. And I used to go out to the lobby and there were 12 deacons and one of them would come out and say what's wrong David I said oh I've got a bad stomach and not one of them recognized that I was under conviction sad that isn't it sad and this went on for months and then one Sunday morning the gospel was preached Psalm 40 you heard me quote it this morning I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear at length to me, did incline my voice and cry to hear. He drew me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, establishing my ways, and put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise unto our God. Many will see it and put their trust in the Lord. And, and I, I had this personal e encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I knew that I was a sinner, and I knew that... that his death on the cross was for me and that my sins were forgiven um, and I praise God for that personal encounter I'm sorry um, I don't know if that, that offends people me giving you my personal testimony but I think it's worth that and it's no different to it, it's different in one sense to yours but we can all say that if we Christians can't we you know we've had a personal encounter with the Lord oh by the way there's a baptismal service on in that, in that morning and I asked the, the, the minister I'd like to be baptized. Can you wait a minute? I'll run up the house and get a change of clothes. <laughs> and they waited. <laughs> and I came back and I was baptized on the spot. Now, I don't recognize that. I don't, re uh, re I don't um, think that's a good thing. But for me, that's what happened. I was baptized that Sunday morning. But every Christian has a personal faith in Christ. Let me ask you, could you give a testimony? I hope you could. The testimony could be completely different. But 
you sh- if you're a Christian, you should have a testimony of experiencing personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God opening your eyes to see the beauty that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are many false ideas about what a Christian is. I read a book by John Blanchard many years ago, his best book. I don't know if you've read it. It's been out many, many years. It was called Right With God. And he, he summarizes false ideas about what a Christian is. I'm developing what I said this morning, really. Let me give you some. Race. Many people say I'm a Christian, obviously, because I am born in a Christian country. First R, race. Obviously, this is not so true today, but there's still an entail of, of, of Christian, Christianity in the country, isn't there? Some people say, well, my race, my, my heritage, the country that I was born, then born in makes me a Christian. And obviously, that does not. Why? Because Adam's blood flows in all our veins. As I said this morning, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So whether we've been born in Wales, in Israel, or anywhere else, we're not Christians because we are born in a particular place. So that's one false idea about what a Christian is. The the second R is religion. And John Blanchard says this, it was religion. All the religious activity we're involved in, attending chapel, giving money, all our praying, all our good deeds do not make us a Christian. You should do those, <laughs> but they don't make you a Christian. That's the second R. The third R is ritual. Going through the ceremonies linked to religion. As I said, I was, I was told to be baptized at 14 because I was 14. <laughs> um, all these ceremonies do not make you a Christian. Baptism, confirmation, membership in a church, partaking of the Lord's Supper even. Uh, The two sacraments that we as Protestants follow, baptism and the Lord's Supper, the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, do not make you a Christian. That's the third R. The fourth fourth R is respectability. I'm a decent living guy, as I said this morning. I'm respected in society. I haven't done anything daft that people know about anyway. Uh, But God's law, you see, probes deeply, doesn't it? It's deeper than our actions. God's law takes into account our thoughts and our imaginations. And so all those things do not make us Christians. What is it? What makes you a Christian? A personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian can say, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know. Do you know? If you were to die tonight, do you know? Are you assured that you will go to heaven? A Christian can say, he loved me and gave himself for me. A Christian can say, I came to Jesus as I was, weary and sad and low. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he he had dealings with individuals. We mentioned one this morning, the the thief on the cross. There are so many other examples, aren't there? The blind man, the leper. See, individuals. Remember the woman at the well? The madman of Gadara? The man with palsy? Lazarus? Peter? So... The true experience of a Christian is that I can. It's individual. It's personal. I hear the gospel. That is, I hear 
about Christ, and I repent. I give that gospel assent. That's intellectual affirmation. The gospel, first of all, comes to the mind, doesn't it? It doesn't bypass the mind. False preachers bypass the mind. They work you up into a frenzy. See? No, no. Becoming a Christian begins by, by you hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You hear the gospel, you repent, you give it assent. That's intellectual affirmation. And then you trust in Christ. And there's a, there's a change, a change of disposition of your heart. And you have affection for Christ. So one aspect of Paul's faith and one aspect of true faith is that it's a personal experience. I, teach, I used to teach the children Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And there the, are the three personal pronouns, aren't there? I, me, and my. The Lord is my shepherd. That's one. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth overfloweth surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever you see personal it's it's a personal thing so one aspect of faith that, uh, as we see that we see in paul here is that it's personal true faith is personal the second thing is this verse 14 so worship I the God of my fathers. Paul's faith was an historic faith. Remember, he was accused of being a Nazarene. And he says, no, no. My faith is an historic faith, faith based upon the word becoming flesh. And dwelling among us. And his faith was based upon historical fact, the historical fact of the Old Testament, and the fact that the Lord Jesus had come. God incarnate, incarnate has come amongst us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see? Three wonderful statements there. And then down to verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld thy glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul's faith is the same as that once given to the saints. And this church believes those facts doesn't it? You are in the true line, the apostolic line of succession. Because you, your, your faith is an historic fact. You believe the faith once delivered to the saints. Praise God for that. And you are the true successors of the apostles. Churches who believe that are the true successors of the apostles, aren't they? Praise God that you, you believe that. And Paul's faith was an historic faith. Today, many churches, so-called churches, preach a different gospel. They don't believe the faith once delivered to the saints. Many people deny the deity of Christ. Many people think that these, the sacrificial, atoning, substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ is an anathema. It's, one man has said child abuse, hasn't he? Isn't that disgusting? You see? They don't believe the faith 
Paul's faith was an historic faith. I was I was speaking to a man who said he was a Christian, he was in us prison, he was a professor of philosophy in Cambridge. And I said, Well, you're a Christian? And I questioned him about Christ and he had all the answers about Christ. And then he said he said, But I don't believe Genesis one. I don't believe that. This is a pro- professor of philosophy from Cambridge, okay? Gend up guy. <laughs> And I thought, Lord, help me to answer this man. <laughs> and I said, I remember my first religious education lesson in Kavatha Grammar School. And we were asked to draw a mountain and, and water underneath the sea. And we were, we were asked to draw an amoeba, followed by a jellyfish, followed by um, fish, followed by reptiles, followed by um, animals up the animal chain and then there was a monkey and you put man on the top of the mountain and I, 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 I told him that and he, I said you believe that yes he said bring it crudely but I believe that so this was of the Lord it wasn't of me so I said to him when did man uh, receive a soul I haven't thought about that he said this is a professor of philosophy from Cambridge who's, who's, who's lecturing religion and philosophy. I hadn't thought of that, he said. You see, <laughs> he didn't believe in an historic faith. Um, Paul's faith was an historic faith. And people today do not believe in the Bible. Our group we pass that, aren't we? We believe that the Bible is the word of God. We believe it from cover to cover. That, that attack is in the past for us, but there are many people who do not believe the Bible to be the word of God, and they take a scissors to it, and they reject what they do not like. Don't talk about sin. That upsets people. Don't talk about hell. Oh, you'll never get people to come to church if you talk about hell. Don't talk about judgment to come. But the truth is, the historic faith that Paul believed was this, that it was he who put Jesus on the cross, and it was you and me who put Jesus on the cross as much as the soldiers did. But despite that, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. And Let me just take you back to the historic faith based upon historical facts concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he came. Okay? Fact. He came into this world. Fact. He lived a sinless life. Fact. He died as our substitute on a hill outside Jerusalem. Historical fact. Three days later, God, his father, resurrected him from the dead. Fact. Historical fact. He ascended into heaven to the position of authority and power, seated at the right hand of God, the father. Fact. He's there now. Fact. There's a man in the glory. There's a man in the glory exercising all authority and power. He's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's interceding on the behalf of his people. Fact. And he's coming again. Fact. You and I, as Christians, we stand fast on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we do is we commend the people to survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Paul said, I worship the God of my fathers. The third aspect of faith that I'd like to bring to your attention is that he says in verse 14, believing all things which are written in the law and 
the prophets. Notice that. What he's saying is this, that Paul's faith is not only an historical faith, it's a biblical faith. Who's saying this? It's a Greek scholar. This man sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teaching rabbis of his day. Here is one of the greatest intellects of his day, or any day. He says, I believe all things. Not some, all things. The Bible's teaching is to believe wholly. And let me just bring up some issues that I've been confronted with recently. Um, you see, Paul's faith is a biblical faith, and he, he believed it all. I believe all things, he said, right? Which are written in the law and the prophets. And so issues come up today. Issues, for example... I'm speaking about these because I've had conversations about this recently. These are issues that are coming up today. Um, homosexuality. Woman bishops. Marriage. Um, transgender issues. Have you heard about that? It's just unbelievable. I read in, in I think it was a telegraph or somewhere like that, that, that a parent was a young child of six or seven was obviously a boy and he said to his mother Mama, I want to become a girl I'm not a boy and his mother said oh yes okay you see transgender issues um, these are all issues that are coming up today confronting Christians and confronting pastors and um, what, what's the answer by the way that, 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 that I'm just telling you what I feel that transgender thing, it's a lie. God has made us male and female. And there's pressure on people who are male to become female and vice versa. You see? I'm just bringing up those points because, because people, people say things like that. All these are not believed because they do not believe the Bible. And we have to face up to the truth today, face up to the fact, and confront these issues. We do it in love, obviously. We do it because we love people. But Paul's faith is a biblical faith. And we, each of us, will have to give an account um, of our lives when we face God. God's word says, this is the word of God. Walk thou in it. The Bereans, they studied the word of God, didn't they? And they said, these were more notable than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Let me ask this question. Is your faith within the parameters of the Bible. That's the best way I can put it. Because if it's true faith, it has to be. Is your faith within the parameters of the Bible? You ask, when these issues come up, what does the Bible have to say? What would the Lord have me to do? You believe this with me, don't you? 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That verse says doctrine. If you want to know what is right, look at the Bible. Doctrine. What is right? Reproof. What is not right? Correction. How to get right. 
instruction in righteousness. How to stay right. I have seven convictions about the God's word. And I'm sure you do. First of all, it's God's inspired word. I won't go into detail about the, these uh, sermons in each of these. God's inspired words. It's God's authoritative word. It's God's sufficient word. It's God's final word. It's God's clear word. You asked, you asked the Holy Spirit. We have God has given us three things, hasn't he? He's given us minds. He's given us a textbook, the Bible, and he's given us a teacher, the Holy Spirit. We don't need any more. God has given us minds, the Bible, his word, and the Holy Spirit. It's his clear word. It's his relevant word. It's the word for today. It's the now word. <laughs> and finally, it's it's his powerful word. Let me ask you, is your faith within the parameters of the Bible? Do you read the Bible? Are you on the narrow way? Or are you not using the plumb line, the Bible, isn't it? to decide what you do and what you believe. Paul's faith was a biblical faith. He says, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And then the fourth and final thing I want to bring to your attention is verse 15. And have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Paul's faith is an optimistic faith. Malcolm Jones taught me this many, many years ago. There's a now and there's a not yet. There's a now and there's a not yet. I have hope towards God. We're saved by grace through faith in hope. And there's coming a day when things will be put right, won't they? We live in, a, in an appalling world at the moment. Dreadful things are happening. But you see, Paul's faith is an optimistic faith. There is coming a day when God will wipe away every tear There'll be no more death and so on, you know, and so much more, isn't it? And so Paul's faith is an optimistic faith, and so should yours be. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absolved through thee I am, from sin, from fear, from guilt and shame. God gives each of us an opportunity to come now to this personal, historic, biblical, optimistic faith. If you haven't already done so, God give you the grace to look away unto yourself, to look unto Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.